Welcome to this uh, revision quiz number two on the ruminant abdominal anatomy. Question one. Give three examples of surgeries that may require a paravertebral nerve block in keto. And the answer is, uh, uh, the first one is, uh, of course, the caesarean section, which is also known as a C-section. And this is performed on uh, cows or heifers that are carrying uh, cows that are too large. So this, uh, these caesarean sections are normally mainly common in immature heifers and due to, you know, large cows. Eh? Other indications for caesarean sections, of course, include uh, inadequate cervical dilation and also ab abnormal pelvic bone conformation or shape in the cow. Then the second surgery is uh, displaced abomasum. This occurs when the abomasum, which is the true stomach, which typically resides on the floor of the abdomen, fills with gas and uh, rises to the top of the abdominal abdomen, rather, where it is said to be displaced. So the abomasum is more likely to be displaced on the left side than on the right side, where it is known as uh, the left uh, displaced abomasum. Then the third surgery that can be performed uh, that requires a, a paravertebral nerve block is, of course, exploratory laparotomy. And this is a, a surgical procedure used to diagnose or further investigate problems inside the abdomen that could not be achieved via preoperative diagnostics. So those are the three examples of surgeries that may require a paravertebral nerve block in keto. Question 2. In which ruminant species does the fleshy part of the external abdominal oblique muscle almost reach the tuber coxae? And the answer is in the goat. So in the goat, uh, the fleshy part or the muscular part of uh, the external abdominal oblique muscle almost reaches the tuber coxae. While in the other species like uh, the bovine especially, the fleshy part of the external abdominal oblique muscle only reaches about midway of uh, the paralumbar fossa. And instead, uh, the muscle ends up connecting to the tuber coxae via its aponeurosis. Question 3. The strong, thick, fibrous band of tissue that uh, attaches to the cranial border of uh, the pubis and uh, provides attachment for the rectus abdominis muscle, the oblique muscles, that is the external and uh, internal abdominal oblique muscles, the gracilis muscle and the pectineus muscles is known as what is it known as so the answer is uh, the prepubic tendon so you can see that the prepubic tendon is uh, very very important in uh, anchoring several important muscles question four true or false the linear alba which is a band of uh, white fibrous tissue that runs along the middle of uh, the ventral abdominal wall from the base of the sternum to the ventral and cranial part of the pubis acts as an insertion point for the transverse abdominis muscle and the oblique muscles and the answer is true indeed uh, the linear alba acts as an insertion point for the three muscles that is the transverse abdominis muscle and the two oblique muscles that is the external and the internal abdominal oblique muscles Question 5. Define the inguinal canal. And the answer is, the inguinal canal is a passage in the caudal abdominal wall which is filled with uh, connective tissue and uh, it contains uh, blood vessels, particularly the testicular artery, testicular vein in the male. And also it contains veins, the spermatic cord, which is uh, found in the male. And also it contains the round ligament of the uterus and this is found in the females. This uh, inguinal canal also has uh, two openings. There is a superficial and a deep ring, which are the openings of uh, the inguinal canal. So the superficial inguinal ring marks the external end of uh, the inguinal canal, while the deep inguinal ring marks the internal or abdominal opening of uh, the inguinal canal. Question 6. What is the clinical significance of uh, the inguinal canal in uh, veterinary medicine? And the answer is, it is a point of weakness which uh, presents uh, surgical problems of uh, inguinal hernias. And also, it is where you find the uh, conditions of uh, cryptokidism occurring. So now a note on the answer. 
the inguinohernia is a, a bulging of uh, the contents of uh, the abdomen through a weak area in the lower abdominal wall and uh, inguinohernias uh, can occur at either of uh, the two inguinal canals so either on the left or on the right side and uh, an inguinohernia can uh, rather occurs if a small part of the intestine drops into the scrotum or in the inguinal canal and uh, the intestine can form a lump in the scrotum or within the inguinal canal itself there are two types of uh, hernias of course associated with the inguinal canal we have uh, what is called the inguinal hernia and also a scrotal hernia so an inguinal hernia will just uh, result in an intestinal mass lodging itself into the inguinal canal whereas a scrotal hernia uh, or which only occurs in males is caused by a failed closure or collapse of uh, the inguinal canal after the descent of the testis or due to failed uh, shrinkage of uh, the deep inguinal ring so this can result into intestinal masses uh, falling into the inguinal canal and uh, eventually into the scrotal sac then uh, cryptochidism is of course a condition in which one or both testes fail to descend from uh, the abdomen into the scrotum so that is uh, the clinical significance of the inguinal canal in veterinary medicine Question 7. Briefly explain why the terms inguinal canal and inguinal ring are misleading in the anatomical sense or anatomically. And the answer is, uh, for the inguinal canal, it is not a canal in the literal sense, but it is just a potential space between the abdominal muscles and their fascia. And uh, then for the inguinal ring, it is not a ring in the literal sense of the word, but it is just a slit-like structure, which is not really circular. Question 8. The spermatic cord is one of uh, the anatomical structures that passes through the inguinal canal of uh, the bull, the buck, and the ram. Of course, even in other animals like uh, the dog and, uh, you know, the, the boar or the pig, the, the spermatic cord is one of the anatomical structures that passes through the inguinal canal. Now, name four anatomical structures that are contained in the spermatic cord. And the answer is... Number one is the ductus deferens, which uh, transmits uh, semen uh, from the ep epididymis to the urethra. Then number two is the testicular artery, which is bringing in oxygenated blood from uh, the aorta into the testes. Then of course we have uh, the pampiniform plexus of veins, which contains uh, the testicular vein. And uh, this pampiniform plexus is just uh, a twisting of uh, the testicular vein against the testicular artery in order for, for, for heat exchange to take, to take place between uh, the testicular artery which contains uh, warm blood and uh, the testicular vein which contains uh, cooler blood. Then of course we also have uh, the genital branch of uh, the genital femoral nerve as uh, one of uh, the components of uh, the spermatic cord. Then other structures that uh, are contained within the spermatic cord include uh, lymphatics and, uh, of course, the sympathetic and uh, parasympathetic nerve fibers. So those are the components of uh, the spermatic cord in the male, and male ruminants as indicated there. Question 9. True or false, the vaginal tunic of uh, the scrotal sac of the bull is part of the peritoneum. Explain your answer. And the answer is true. The vaginal tunic of uh, the scrotum is part of the peritoneum because the peritoneum is put into the scrotal sac together with the testis during the testicular descent in the embryo. So during uh, embryonic development, the testis are normally located in the abdominal cavity and there comes a point when uh, the testis should now be transported uh, to the scrotal sac and uh, this happens uh, using uh, hormones and uh, some anatomical structures within the embryo, specifically the gubernaculum. So the testis becomes pulled towards the, the, the scrotal sac. And uh, while this is happening, the peritoneum also gets wrapped around the testis. And as a result, the peritoneum gets pulled together with, with the testis as it gets lodged into the scrotum. And this is how the vaginal tunic of the scrotal sac of the bull is part of the peritoneum. Question 10. 
A part of the gastric groove known as the reticular groove connects uh, which two organs of uh, the abdominal cavity? And the answer is it connects the reticulum and uh, the omasum. So the reticular groove is the first part of uh, what is known as uh, the gastric groove. And uh, the gastric groove is just an anatomical structure which is located in the stomach of ruminants and uh, particularly young ruminants, uh, calves specifically, and uh, also young goats or kids. And it extends from uh, the orifice of uh, the cardia until near the pylorus through the lesser curvature of the reticulum, omesum, and uh, abomesum. So the gastric groove is divided into three parts. There is uh, what is known as uh, the reticular groove or sulcus reticuli, which is being uh, defined in this question. And also there is uh, the second part, which is the omeso groove, also known as the sulcus omezi. And then we have a third part, which is the abomeso groove, also known as the sulcus abomesi. So the function of uh, the gastric groove, together also with, with uh, its uh, first part, the reticular groove, is to shunt milk from uh, the esophagus into the omezum and abomesum so that the milk does not fall into the reticulum or the uh, rumen where it might end up being fermented and uh, this might cause uh, bloat in the young animals. So the primary function uh, of uh, this uh, reticular groove and uh, also the gastric groove is to allow milk in calves to bypass the rumen directly into the abomesum, thereby preventing accidental fermentation of the milk in the rumen.